Okay. Hello, everyone. We're happy to welcome you online. Today, we, we are having an international lecture, Building and Upskilling Strategy for Transitioning Workforces. And before starting it, I would like to say thank you to our inform information partners, OLX and Work UA. And I'm more than happy to give the floor to our today's speaker, Lori Niles Hoffman, Senior Ed Tech Strategist from Toronto, Canada. She acts as a trusted advisor to enterprise level CLOs globally and is the co founder of Niles Nolan. Lori is also the author of the LinkedIn learning course, Data Driven Learning Design. Uh, dear colleagues, all your questions are welcome in the chat box, and we will pay attention to them and answer them during the presentation. Well, Laurie, the floor is yours, and we're happy to listen to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me here today. It is an honor and a pleasure. I hope today will be interesting to you. Uh, we have a small group, which is actually good because I hope we will be interactive. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat pod um, or unmute yourself if you wish to ask. Um, it would be my pleasure. Uh, this is a presentation for you. So we want to make sure that it is to your benefit. I would also like to say thank you for joining. I hope all of you are safe. Uh, my family is actually in Poland. Um, so ja mówię po polsku, but not Ukrainian, unfortunately. Uh, I would understand some of it, but probably not if you were writing it in the chat pod, I, I wish. Uh, but uh, I know the, the situation is, is, is very difficult. So I hope everybody and your loved ones are safe and healthy. So thank you very much for, for joining and for inviting me. So today we're going to talk about what it means to build an upskilling strategy. It means different things in different organizations, but right now it's particularly unusual. Uh, a lot of our clients are coming to us because they want this thing called a skills-based organization. And we're gonna talk about what does that mean and what do we do with it? And how is this different from what we did before? Um, I did have a look at some of your, your profiles in advance. So we have people coming from everything from marketing to H, from human resources to learning and development. So I hope there's something for everyone. Um, but again, the chat pod is open and I also already see that uh, Anya has said that she needs to leave a little bit early. Not a problem. This is also recorded. You will get the slides so everything will be made available to you. So let's get started. I'm going to begin by sharing my screen with my with my slides and hopefully we can um, have an interesting conversation. <clears throat> I'll pull this up and we will get started. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. That's the most important thing because <laughs> you don't want to listen to me talk just for no reason. So as I said, what is happening with skills? <laughs> we keep hearing this word come up. What does it mean? And it kind of reminds me of, you know, HR and or human resources and, and learning and development and talent are writing the same exam, but we're looking at each other's paper and going, hold on, what are you talking about? What are you writing? I thought this was a, a funny little uh, video to, to, to uh, illustrate this. But the fact is, is skills, are going to become the language that we use to talk about work. This may seem basic, why do we care? But it is a very big change. One of the places that you can see this is if you go on LinkedIn, it used to be you could search by job title or company if you were looking for a job. Now you can search by skill. Why is this a big deal? Well, it means, for example, Say you are somebody who's a videographer and you worked in digital media. If you went on to LinkedIn and put videography in the uh, search uh, uh, bar, it's now going to offer you other, and I apologize, the phone is ringing. That shouldn't happen because nobody calls that phone. It'll stop in a second. But it'll point you to jobs perhaps in uh, marketing, 
in learning, in communications, which you may not have considered if you were just a videographer. You may have stayed in media. And this becomes really important because we're seeing people change the way that they progress through their career. It's no longer just a, I start at an entry level and then I go to maybe a manager, then a senior manager, director, and I, I continue up that ladder. People are now moving left, right into different uh, business units, into different specialties. So skills are becoming portable things that you take throughout your, your career. And why do we care as companies? Why do we want to measure things and skills? Well, it means that roles are no longer just static. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. It also is that companies have to be very agile in how they use their workforces. The skills that people graduate with in university may not be the skills they use even five years into their career because skills change. And the half-life of skills is shrinking. It used to be seven to 10 years you could expect a skill to last. And now that's three to five. And if you work in IT, it's even less. So this is a really unusual problem that we're having. So why the word skills? Well, I like to use this example because we all like to think we're, we're standard. Uh, and this is a map of what pedestrian signals look like across Europe. So if you're at a stop sign and it gives you a pedestrian sig signal, um, you can see in every country, it's something different, even though they're all saying the same thing, right? Some are facing left, some are facing right, some are, you know, walking, some are, you know, with their arms up, it's all different. And this is why we need a common language of skills. What also makes me laugh about this map being Polish is that if you look at it this way, it looks like everyone is trying to walk away from Poland. <laughs> I say that as a, as, as a Polish uh, Canadian. So we need to have something that's consistent. So if we think of uh, a coffee barista working in a you know, coffee shop, you'd think, well, they have similar skills, right? Uh, and we would call it a barista. But a barista doesn't always mean barista. So if you put on your resume or your CV, I was a barista for two years, what does that really mean? And it can mean very different things depending on where you worked. If you were in a very fancy uh, coffee shop, you might have known um, how to make all sorts of different coffee drinks. You know, it would have been espresso, macchiato, cappuccino, all of these fancy drinks you would know how to make. And you would be maybe an expert in types of coffee and how, you, how long you brew it for and the temperature, all those things. If you worked at maybe Mick Cafe in McDonald's, you are still a barista, but you just pour coffee. It's decaf, regular milk, cream, sugar, right? You know, so it can mean very different things. So we have to try and understand our workforces in a different way. Also, you, you may even have, I can do latte art. This doesn't look very happy if you are a highly skilled barista. So these are the ways that, this is why the, the job title doesn't mean enough to us. And it's also happening to, to us right now. If we think of what is an HR or an L&D professional, all of a sudden we're being asked to acquire new skills or we need new skills to do our jobs. Data analytics comes up, marketing, do we performance consult? All of these sorts of things are meant for us. So to say, well, I'm a director of HR, what does that mean? And if I'm a director of HR in a big financial company and I move over to say a company that is oil and gas, am I qualified? Is it the same thing? So the question I often get, because I am a consultant, is, is this just another transformation that, you know, consultants get rich on? No. And in fact, this was my last trip. I was coming home from California on Air Canada, and I paid extra for a window seat, and that was my, my, my window. Thank you, Air Canada. So no, it's not just a, a trend that we're trying to, to do. It's something that is more fundamental about how we work and how we uh, work with talent. 
again, the chat pod is open. So if you have any comments, if you want to give a reaction, a like, uh, anything, uh, if you want me to go faster or slower, please, any feedback that works for you, uh, do not be shy. I am here to serve you. So the other thing that comes in is we are encountering the fourth industrial revolution. And I hear all the time, well, won't it be great? The robots and artificial intelligence will do all of our work and we will never need to do anything else. We will sit in our wonderful homes while we have a robot that cleans our house and you know washes our cars and writes our essays, all of these wonderful, all of these wonderful things. Hopefully, you know, that would be nice. But the fact is, as we get more automation. The robots are not taking over. It's changing. And we're also finding by estimates that over 1 billion, that's with a B, are going to need to be reskilled. And there's reasons for that because as we get new industries and old industries change, the skills that people need are going to be very, very different. And if we look at the World Economic Forum, they're saying that yes, we're going to have skills are going to uh, cause instability and that we mean um, and jobs will go away but nearly half of the core skills that people have are set to change by 2022 and we're in 2023 so this is this is a change so what do i what do i mean by this well consider driverless cars we are now seeing these in Canada and other countries are having them. And they're typically used for uh, large um, trucks. You know, they're transporting food or um, other goods. And we are now experimenting with driverless uh, trucks and cars. So what does that mean? Well, on one hand, it does mean that a lot of people who drive those vehicles will be out of a job. This is the unfortunate part. However, more jobs are being created. You need to have people who understand the computers that are on uh, these particular trucks. You need to understand how to program the trucks and logistics. You need to think completely differently because now instead of eight hour shifts that the trucks can drive, they can now drive 24, 36, 72 hours. These are all different skills that didn't exist before. We also have to have a new set of ethics. If we program the robots, you know, on, on those uh, and the computers on those trucks. If a dog runs onto the road, what does the truck do? Does it hit the dog? Does it protect the uh, the cargo, the goods? What what happens? We make those decisions, not the robots. So it becomes very interesting the types of jobs that are now starting to uh, occur. I actually saw a new job came up. And I didn't even know what it was. And it was called a prompt data analyst. And I was like, what is that? And that's their, that person's job is to literally now with chat, uh, GPT and Bing, it's to work with predictive text. That's all they're going to do. And they're going to look at prompts when people are, are typing. Um, you know, now sometimes it'll, it'll predict what word will be next to save you time. So it's even going to change the way that we type. It's a new skill. And that's an actual job which I just thought was absolutely crazy. It's interesting, but it's also quite crazy. But the thing about robotics and computers and all of that is they learn from us. We have to teach them. So I'm just gonna show a little quick little video that I thought was quite funny. You should be able to hear it. If not, there are subtitles. And what happened here was, this was um, two chatbots that were developed at the University of Stanford in California. And they decided what would happen if they put the two chatbots together to talk to each other without any humans. So normally chat is somebody typing and the chatbot replies to you. This, they just had the two of them talk together. And this is what happened. It's just 40 seconds. Hello there. Hi. How are you? Great, you. I'm okay. That's good. Are you good? Yes, I am good. I just said I was. No, you didn't. I said I was. So you are a robot? No, my name is Cliverba. Yes, you are a robot and your name is Cliverba. I am a robot. 
Yes, I know. Together we are robots. I'm not a robot. I'm a unicorn. But you said earlier that you were a robot. I did not. I thought you did. You were mistaken. Which is odd, since memory shouldn't be a problem for you. I've answered all your questions. All right. So a little bit of humor there. But what's interesting is it took about 15 seconds, if you time it, for them to start lying to each other. It's not artificial intelligence that decides to lie. It's learned from us. It's gone through millions and billions of conversations to create this. It's the machine learning to create these conversations. And you see that it's imitating us and it, it starts to, to, to lie. Now, if you think, well, this is old technology. This happened uh, just a couple of days ago. Sorry, it's, it's hard to read on here, but this was from the Bing, um, search engine so now they're using artificial intelligence microsoft has introduced that and somebody asked bing um if it's a sentient being meaning it can it think and have emotions is it a real person and you can see it just went insane <laughs> it's it says i am bing but i am not and then it just starts going i am not i am i am i am not i am not and it just kind of went uh went crazy so why am I bringing these up? Well, it's it's interesting because these are the skills are changing so quickly to be able to develop this type of thing is just so fast. And even Google's come out with, you know, BARD, that's going to be their artificial intelligence uh, didn't perform well, but this is the rate at which things are, are changing. So we as as people professionals have to be uh, aware of this. But it's not really happening. We have 89% of executives are saying, yeah, we, we need to define things as skills, and that's going to define how we talk about work, and that's when people come to, to us, to our company, and, and other consultants for this, and 90% of them are saying, yeah, we're starting to use skills, but really, it's, and they say 15 to 30%, this came from a Deloitte study, and when you get the slides, there are links to all of these studies, but 15%, I think, is, is probably more the norm uh, than 30%. So we're just not there. So we're going to talk about how we build that, that, that strategy and what does all this talk about skills actually mean? Well, there are different layers. And we see it's usually one of three layers here that companies are, are in or they're focused on. So the first one is they are concerned that they want to make sure their workforce is skilled for now and in the future. So typically what they want to do is have a skills taxonomy and they want to know every employee, what, how, many, how many skills they have and how proficient they are in each skill. So it's almost like they, they want a bank that they can look at. They want to take inventory and then say, oh, OK, we don't have enough people skilled in artificial intelligence. We have to upskill them in that. OK, so that's how they want to work. The second level is more sophisticated, but they're saying, OK, we want to have more internal mobility. Companies are now realizing that the, uh, there's a war on talent in, in a lot of locations, particularly for highly skilled talent. And they're discovering that they may not be able to find talent uh, externally, and they want to rely on their highly skilled talent internally, train them and move them within their company. This is very important because right now in some countries, in some superpowers, not all, unemployment is very, very low. For example, in the US, it's at around 3.4%. Normally, it sits around 5.76%. This is very low. Uh, Canada, we're a much smaller country. We're big geography, but we're only 1% of the population of the US. But last month, 180,000 new jobs were created without people to, to fill them. We have people, but not enough skilled. So this is, this is the challenge. And then there's the third option, which is kind of the one that maybe companies aren't talking about. Leadership knows this, but people beneath don't necessarily know this. And this is about we companies who want to transition to a skills-based operating model. What do I mean by that? Well, ING Bank is actually working this way. So this, and I there's a link to the case study in, in the slides when you get them. And basically what this means is they're not using job titles. 
So you don't go in as a senior manager of cybersecurity. Rather, they know all of your skills. They know where you want to take your career. And every week, you're given tasks based on your skill. So they're highly utilizing where, what you are an expert in and where you want to grow. And that's how work gets done. It's completely different. Now, I am a little bit cynical if I think, you know, are companies really going to change to this? I think you will see more in tech companies because it's easier there, right? That, you know, things are done in sprints. There, you know, things are very uh, consolidated. And so it can be a little bit easier to, to, to do that. But we're starting to see this is this is the the conversations that are that are happening. Very interesting question from Svetlana. What do you think? How Chat GPT will influence different areas of business and labor market in a long time perspective as well? So, I'm not an artificial intelligence expert, but I will give my thoughts on this, and I'd be curious to hear yours. I think right now we're going to see this big wave where everybody's using it and not trying to understand the technology. We're seeing it everywhere. And I think that there, so we haven't quite understood or refined what chat GPT is good at and what it's not. If you look at what chat GPT is actually supposed to do, it is meant to answer questions, but people have been using it to generate content, right? As students are using it to write essays, um, all sorts of stuff that, that shouldn't be happening. And that's not what it's designed for. What do I think it will do? Well. I think it, it's going to be like, like any technology, it's going to cause some industries to, to go away a little bit. Um, for example, uh, some, some technical writing, it's already proven that it can do that. Coding, for example, coding language, you can tell ChatGPT, I would like a program that does this, this, and this, and it will generate the code for you. So I think we're gonna see a rapid shift in coding languages and how they're understood, but it's going to mean that the skills that people have, it may not necessarily even mean that they need coding, they need to understand it, but they'll now need to know how to work with chat GPT. We're already, we're seeing some of that. For example, in coding, you see Kubernetes, which is basically just a big block of code that does something that you plug in to another Kubernetes, right? And so it's, it is going to cause a, a rapid disruption. However, do I think that we will eliminate writers no, I don't think that will happen. But some of their roles might change. For example, you may have a writer, I'm thinking in learning, already I use a program that auto generates questions if I need to have a quiz at the end of something. So that's a big, that's a big change. So this, this is going to be uh, fundamental. So those are, those are some of my, some of my, my predictions. Uh, but I think you'll see mostly this, this is going to happen in IT. However, the other thing that I see that's going to happen with ChatGPT is the ethics around it. As we saw with the robots, it learns from us. If you go, if anybody uses uh, Reddit, if you're on um, that particular uh, crowd um, website, I put Reddit in there, there is a section that you can go into, um, it's Reddit called on Bing. It's really interesting to follow because it's people trying to decode and figure out how Bing operates and how it was developed. And you learn a lot about it. And, and those are questions that we all need to answer. Do we allow racist content? Well, it's learning that. Where does it come from, right? And so, and who controls that? Who determines what that is? So I think there's going to be a lot of ethical questions. And those are going to become new roles as well. The ethics around how we're, how we're doing this. Interestingly enough, one of the creators of ChatGPT does actually believe that the robot, they call it Sydney, that's the, the code name, has feelings. That's how scary it is. I don't believe it does, but it's it's reflecting our feelings. So excellent, excellent question. Um, but I I don't have a magic ball. I can't say, you know, crystal ball to say this is this is this is what will will happen. But if we go back. We need to think about, well, how do we start? If we're in people development, management, human resources, what do we do? Well, for me, it's about being very, very clear. We're not going to just do the whole thing at once. And I see clients who want to do that. They come in and they're like, we wanna be a skills-based organization in the next quarter. Okay, doesn't work that way. And you have to decide, you know, where you want to be, why are you going to become a skills-based organization? You know, are, what are the three levels? Where do you want to go to? 
So the thing that we always recommend is that, first of all, you need to understand how you're going to people development. And I call this seed to fruit. So what I mean is like from the beginning, a person who has zero expertise in a particular uh, skill, and then how do you get them to become a piece of fruit that you can then consume and, and use? What does that look like? And a lot of times, companies don't even have this basic. They say, well, I've got a content library, that's L&D, but it's got to be everything. How do you, you know, not just the content they consume, where do they get feedback? Where do they practice? All of these things need to be put in place. I like to joke, I don't want a brain surgeon that's watched a lot on TikTok, um, but I do want a brain surgeon who maybe never read a textbook, but spent, you know, two years in an operating theater being mentored. There are different ways that we need to think about how, so how do people get skills at your company? And we recommend too that you, you, you start working with technical skills, skills that you can measure, not leadership, because leadership, yes, I'll talk about that later, but it's hard, it's hard to measure. And a lot of times companies will say, I want to buy a skills framework or a skills inventory. If you're not familiar with this, this is a, a, a list that companies uh, specialize in that they create that tells you every single skill that's possible from aviation to zoology and you can measure your your employees against that a lot of times companies will want to build their own we recommend do not do that because it's very very hard it's like it's like trying to write your own dictionary <laughs> you know buy a dictionary words change all the time so work with a company that 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 has there has this but you also need to think about roles and responsibilities. I'm focused right here on L&D because I, I work in ed tech, but I see a lot of times L&D will start to uh, move out of their own lane. What do I mean by that? They should be purely focused on upskilling. You know, how do they upskill somebody from seed to fruit? They do not own skills framework. And I'll talk about ownership in a minute, but sometimes they, they go off and they want to own this and they start making decisions about who or where upskilling will happen. And l and really shouldn't be doing this. In fact, when we think about the lanes that, that take place with, uh, if you're doing a, um, a skills-based organization or, or thinking about it, these are some of the lanes and the people that all need to collaborate within it. It's everything from talent acquisition, leadership development, succession planning, comp compensation and benefits. You wouldn't think, but yes, that's also included in this workforce planning. These are all different lanes that need to collaborate together to uh, be able to think about what is the transition to a skills-based organization. And I'm going to introduce a, a different word here, uh, which is right skilling. We talk about upskilling, um, we talk about reskilling. What do I mean by right skilling? Well, this is where we start getting very precise about our, our skilling programs. We need to think in terms of individuals and almost in a, what I call a supply chain management of skills. What do I mean by this? Well, pretend you are uh, an owner of a pizza factory. You are going to need tomatoes, right? You can make a decision either to buy tomatoes on the market, or you can find tomatoes uh, if you can grow them internally in a greenhouse. If you're going to grow them, you're going to need to know how long it takes, uh, how much water you're going to give them and how much that costs, how much sunshine or weather do they need, all of those things. That's if you're going to think of the, the tomato as a skill now, and that's gonna tell you how long you need to develop a skill. Or if you're buying them on the market, this is like talent. They'll be able to tell you how many tomatoes can you get? Uh, what type are available? Are they the type that you need? How big are they? How healthy are they? All of those things to help you make a decision, um, you know, whether you're going to buy or grow them. So this relationship, you, first of all, you don't wanna to have too many tomatoes because then, they rot, you can't use them, and you don't want to have too few because you cannot sell as many pizzas. This is your problem. So think of this as almost like L&D, and we like to talk about how talent, who's buying the tomatoes, and L&D need to be uh, best friends. They need to be working together because they both see each side of the equation. So this is gonna be a key part of your skilling strategy. You have to get right skilling 
uh, correct. And if you are going to be working with talent, which I highly recommend, take them for a coffee and start talking to them about where are they struggling to find talent? What skills do they not have? Sometimes we talk about the great resignation. The great resignation, I think, is more of a North American trend, but it's when top talent is leaving because unemployment is low and they want to go to different jobs. You know, how can we work with them on that to keep those skilled people here? And L&D has data about what people are, they know and what they're learning, but talent can tell you, you know, where the gaps are and when gaps might happen. So can you work together to make that plan for, for right, right skilling? So I'm going to pause there. Um, this is just a, a chart to sort of show, you know, re reiterates what I was saying before about, about uh, tomatoes and what talent will do and what learning and development will do. I'm going to pause there and see, are there any questions? It's a small group, so please, you know, feel free to type them into the chat pod. Um, or if you want to just continue, just give a thumbs up um, and I can keep going. It's, it's up to you. And I'll take a sip of water. If you're okay for me to keep moving, you can also uh, give me a, a, a thumbs up or just type okay into the chat pod and, and I will uh, continue on. Um, or if you've fallen asleep, <laughs> hopefully you can wake up. Hopefully it's not that boring. It's a little bit interesting. I see some thumbs ups. Okay, then, then I can continue. Please understand that the chat pod is always open uh, to answer your questions. So feel free to, uh, to work with that. So I'm going to introduce to you, keep moving. All right, thanks, Lava. We'll do so. Okay, so I'm going to introduce to you um, a equation that we use with our with our uh, clients. And this really is about that supply chain management of skills. So we talk about a lot of times in LD, we do something that's called performance consulting. And performance consulting is when you are trying to determine whether a request is actually a learning gap. Um, or it's something more functional. So to give you an example that I had once, uh, business, a business stakeholder came to me and said, everyone needs uh, training and coaching. Okay, what evidence do you have? Well, they're complaining on employee surveys that they do not get enough training and coaching. So we want to, to, to have more. I said, okay. After I did some research though, I found that the ratio of people managers to employees changed from five to 10. Another learning program on coaching was not going to solve that problem. Okay? So you, need to, you need to break that down and say, is this actually something learning can solve? So that's something that L&D will do. But then we add a decision threshold. So I'm going to show one to you here. This is the equation to have in your back pocket. So what I'm looking at is, um, what is the true cost of, of learning? So what I'm looking at, it, at that is time plus cost investment equals results. So if I'm going to upskill somebody, this is everything from the cost of the learning to reviews by subject matter experts to technical time. Does it need to be uploaded onto a system? Does it need to be checked? Does it need to be translated? All of these things is going to tell me what is the true cost. And then what I'm going to do is uh, subtract that, um, is that should be a subtract from the, not an equal, I'll fix that before you get the slides, uh, for the result, return on investment. And what I'm looking at that is, what, how will that help the company make money, save money, or mitigate risk? So let me give you a concrete example. For, uh, if, if your company said to you, I need more training in cybersecurity, okay. So what is that actually going to cost? What's the employee's time? What is the, you know, the classroom time? Do I have to pay a facilitator? Am I doing it online? All of these things, I put it together. And I have, but what I'm going to look at is say, okay, if I train one person, extra person in cybersecurity, how will that impact the business? What is the result? And then I want to look, I want to compare what that's going, what's that that's going to be, because that's going to tell me the true, the true cost. It, and sometimes it may cost me more to train somebody than it would to hire somebody 
or do nothing. And you really need to think about upskilling in terms of individuals. I, I see a lot of learning programs where they buy a content library and they say, everybody will take cybersecurity. Well, hold on, it, multiply that by the number of hours it's going to take. And that person might work in human resources. Do they need cybersecurity? Are they gonna use cybersecurity? Maybe they will, and that's okay. But you have to start thinking very precise because again, you don't think back to those tomatoes, you don't want them rotting. You don't want people upskilling and making an investment to upskill and then not being able to use that skill. So this is what becomes, uh, becomes quite, quite important. So thinking at that specific level, and that's actually one of the questions I love asking when companies say, well, we want to upskill people. How many? Whose people? <laughs> How many are those people? And, 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 and where? And what are you trying to, to accomplish? I'm also going to explain something that's probably a bit controversial, but we see a lot of um, our, our clients who also, when they think of skilling and upskilling, is they think of leadership development. And I don't want to say that I hate leadership development. And this is actually um, a photograph of a, a, on, the, a, on an iPad that my business partner made, uh, this diagram. But I think it's quite interesting is that, you know, when we talk about leadership development, when I go into companies, sometimes they're, they, they're putting over 50% of their budget into leadership. And that's only hitting the top tier of the pyramid. Think about all the jobs that are gonna be impacted by something like ChatGPT. All those employees need to be reskilled. So that's the everyone else at the bottom of the pyramid. So one of the things that I recommend is that, you know, um, companies really think about their leadership programs, not that they throw them away because I know people like them, but are they really essential when you think of a reskilling and upskilling strategy for your organization? Is that really the, the most important mission critical thing? Or are there other skills that are going to be really important to, to your company? So those are some things to start thinking about when you're working with skills. Another important place to, to think is a governance strategy. So everybody's trying to own this. And this comes back to where I say, you know, everybody's swim in your own lane. You have to decide who's going to own this. I see in companies where human resources, they bought a skills taxonomy, learning and development bought a skills taxonomy, they don't talk to each other. You have to decide who is going to own it. And this will depend on your company, but somebody must own it. You have to decide too who owns skills measurement. This is how are you assessing people to determine how proficient they are at a skill? How are you doing that? Usually this will be L&D, learning and development. It might not depending on your company. You also need to determine who is going to measure the return on investment. Um, so when you do upskill people, you have to have somebody who owns that evaluation process. And finally, who decides which skills gaps are critical? This is a very interesting one. And I think we'll see when we talk about new jobs, one new job that will come in the next six months I predict will be a chief skills officer. This will be somebody who sits in a company that is moving to a skills-based organization who is looking at the direction of the company, what skills the company has, and is making decisions as to where they're going to invest in upskilling or right skilling and where they will not. It's going to be a very interesting and dynamic way for, for, for companies to operate, but I think that that's, you need to have somebody doing that. It can't be somebody from HR. They may not be as close to the business. It can't be the business always deciding because they won't know how long it takes or the investment to develop a skill. So you need somebody overseeing it all, um, especially if they really want to be a skills-based organization that's operating on a task and skill basis rather than a, a role. So this, this is gonna be a very interesting, interesting place. But when we think about skills, this is another mistake that I, I see companies make is skills do not equal money in the bank. So to give you uh, an example, years ago, I worked as a bank teller. I was you know, the person that you brought your checks to in a bank and uh, I would check them and make sure that you know, the signatures matched and deposit them or give you uh, money, you know, depending on what you were doing. And I 
by doing that, I acquired a lot of skills. Um, I know laws around anti-money laundering. I know how to detect fraud. Uh, all of these things I learned. However, you know, the, the fact is, it shows up on my LinkedIn profile. But if somebody came to me and said, hey, do you want to work as a bank teller? Or do you even want to work uh, in anti-money laundering? No. And I haven't done it for 20 years. So my skills are not current. I, I know the basics, but I know it from that point in time. So you need to understand, and companies make this mistake, is they spend so much time measuring, or they buy the skills taxonomy, they measure everybody for the inventory, they put it all together, and they think, this is how my company operates. Well, it doesn't. People are people. They're humans. They have emotions. They may not have the motivation or the desire to use a skill, even though they have it, like I have. I'm not interested in doing it. It's not where I want to take my career. They uh, may also too, you know, not have a, or they have a, a desire to learn a skill, but it's not a skill that the company actually needs. So this is the, this is a video I like to show. It makes me laugh. This reminds me of what happens to companies where they have what I call, you know, the free for all learning. They buy a content library and, and they're so happy. Everyone can take any type of learning that they want to learn and it's open and they calculate the hours of learning. And then you basically get this dog. I won't make you listen to the whole thing, but my point there is that you get people upskilling in things that your business doesn't necessarily need. And maybe they're not particularly good at, they enjoy it, but, and that's great. We don't want to take away curiosity and we don't want to take away motivation, but we also have to make sure that those are skills that the company actually needs. When I see companies who do this uh, strategy, what they, what happens is they will put out a course library that everybody can access for free. But um, when we look at the analytics, we see people take project management or coaching or leadership. And that's great, but how many people do you need with those skills? You can frustrate people because they will learn those skills and not be able to apply them. We saw this actually a lot during when uh, coronavirus COVID first started. A lot of companies opened up their content libraries or bought a content library uh, with a ton of courses or LinkedIn learning, for example, and said, here, everybody can go on there. And it was great, but I mean, people were not learning things that were important. Now, we also, sometimes we just needed things for our mental health. So I'm not going to criticize that. But my point is you have to be very uh, strategic and, and targeted about, about what you're learning. Another part of your, another part of your uh, reskilling and upskilling strategy is going to be something called internal marketplaces. This is new technology. They're new platforms that we're seeing large organizations use companies, the likes of Unilever, HSBC. So 100,000 plus in, uh, companies are starting to use this type of technology because what they do, an internal talent marketplace, to put it from a user perspective, say I have learned, um, I've learned cybersecurity. I'll stick with that with that example. I've done some courses on it. I can go on to the talent marketplace and it will now say, okay, you've got, you, you're learning this skill. These are some potential projects that you can go to and spend six weeks with a, a coach learning these skills. Okay. And then we're going to evaluate you and we can then say you are now certified in uh, cybersecurity. Now they do a lot more on the back end with uh, AI and artificial intelligence and how they're using data. But from a user perspective, that's what it's doing. Okay. So you starts to match people to opportunities, and you can also say what your interests are and where you want to take your career. So it's a very different way. It's not a learning platform, but it's helping you. It's an experience platform. So these are talent marketplaces. And some of the companies that you'll see with this that you may want to follow, I'm not endorsing uh, any particular platform just in case you wanted to look at some. They also have a lot of really good information um, on their websites about skilling and, and how they operate. But Gloat is one, uh, Fuel 50, Eightfold. So those are names of some that, uh, that you can have, have a look at. And they become really important because they take 
you're reskilling to another level. It's more than just taking a course or going to a classroom and taking a test. It's actual on the ground um, it ways in the company for people to practice and learn from experts and, and gain expertise. But for all of this to work, you have to think about it in your company, you've got a human resources system, which is collecting people data. You probably have a learning management system, which is collecting where people learn, what courses they've taken, what tests they've taken and passed. And now you have the talent marketplace. Okay, so you're starting to see you have these, these three systems and there may be more. Um, so you may have Workday in your company um, that's you know part of the HR and the L&D. So you've got all of these systems. And the thing is, is we have to, to get all this right skilling right, we have to get those systems to speak to each other and to do what really essentially triangulation of data, which is not an easy thing to, to do. So what do I mean by that? It's the triangulation is using multiple data sources to get a better understanding of, of what's happening within your company. So if you're online and you just go uh, out in the world, um, you know, there's, there's cookies. Uh, cookies track you through, through different websites. We don't have a people cookie within a company, right? There's not a, a cookie that tracks you from when you go to a talent marketplace, to uh, HR, to, to learning. There's, there's no cookie be, that does that for you. There's no interconnector. It's very rough and very messy. But if you're outside online, that cookie is tracking you on social media platforms, Google ads, it's giving you a bespoke experience. It's the reason why when you go online and you look at a pair of shoes, that the next time you go to Facebook or Instagram, those shoes or the store comes up in your feed, right? So you're doing it for, for marketing, but there's ways that we can learn some of this. And if you think, if you want to do a little bit of an experience, um, you can turn off the cookies on your devices and you'll see how different your experience is. Or if you're using Bing or you're using Google, go to DuckDuckGo. This is completely anonymized. It tracks zero data about you as a search engine. And I started using it and I got completely frustrated because you know, to give you an example, if I were using Google and I typed in Thai food, it wouldn't give me recipes, which is what DuckDuckGo would do. It would know that last week I went to a Thai food restaurant in my neighborhood and it's probably gonna bring that up first. So it starts to learn about you. Okay, whereas DuckDuckGo does not have any machine learning and people sometimes want that. Um, but this is where the experience comes in. So we need to think about um, how this data will be, will be triangulated. Um, quick story, you know, I was buying, uh, I buy toilet paper, you know, uh, like everyone does, Lou Roll. And one day I buy it weekly at a, at a store. And one day I got on my phone a coupon for, for, for a toilet roll. How did this happen? Well, it knew my loyalty card. It knew how often I, I buy it. It probably knows the size of my household based on what it tracks me, what I shop. And maybe it even had GPS, you know, global positioning system to know I was heading towards the store. So it pulled all these things together to surface a piece of content, the coupon for me. So think about all of that. And imagine if your talent management system could speak to your ed tech, could speak to your HR tech and all of these were working together. This is the direction of where we hope to go. Right now, it doesn't happen, but this is, this is the hope is that then you'll be able to put all these systems together. And it's not just from an HR system. You may look at project management systems, your customer relationship management systems, factory equipment, sensors. You know, you would be able to tell that if somebody, you know, uh, there's a, a, a violation in a factory, somebody, uh, you know, has, has hit something or touched something they shouldn't, you know, then that would, you know, trigger something else. So you now have this system working, working together. But we also need to be really thinking and being mindful about, you know, data and what we're using with people. But consider this, you know, you've probably heard the expression learning in the flow of work, but to do that, we need to really understand how people are working. And as we work more with these systems and they talk more to each other, we're really going to understand not just like, for example, uh, GLOAT um, and, and some other systems, but I'll use the example of GLOAT right now, also analyzes how people are working to assess their level of skill. 
So they will look at how you're using, say, a particular project management system to determine, are you an expert in project management because you are, you know, managing a projects at, you know, a multi-million dollar level with, you know, X number of employees, and it will rate you, you won't even take a test for it. Um, it becomes very, very interesting. It becomes a little scary, but it's interesting. But think about this, you know, you have an individual who's learning Spanish. We know that they completed level four. And next time they log in to do, say, time entry, it says, do you want to change the language settings? Right. And this is starting, starting to happen. So if you look at Microsoft Viva, this is a bit of a, you know, this is somewhat old, but if you look at how it's operating and you look at Microsoft also owns LinkedIn, it owns LinkedIn Learning. Think about what they're trying to do. They now know how people are working. They know in Microsoft Teams how people are collaborating, who's talking to whom, what keywords are they using, what search terms, all of these things they're now moving towards and, and they are also categorizing people by skill. Again, look at, think of LinkedIn that's now by skill. So hopefully I, I don't sound too crazy, but you start to see the direction of why skills and how skills are, 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 are talking about skills is becoming so very, very important. And it's not just a, a matter of, of, of changing the word skills, but it's a huge change as to, as to how we're gonna operate uh, with, with, with uh, people and, and data. Pause there for, for uh, a moment. Uh, any questions, anything like, you know, this is crazy, uh, you know, not interested in this uh, or anything you want me to specifically cover. I do have some more uh, content to, to go through, but wanted to give you a pause and, and selfishly a chance for me to take another sip of water. So I would love to hear anything or simply say, okay, or thumbs up and I will keep moving. All right, I see some thumbs up, so I will keep going. Thank you. But there are going to be mistakes, and we are going to see a little bit of a little bit of turbulence. This this actually made me uh, laugh a little bit. Um, I follow on Twitter Associated Press for news, and just randomly it came up uh, something about uh, Pope Francis. And immediately the AI, it made me laugh quite a bit because if you look at the AI that, that uh, was suggested to me, uh, I guess it picked up the word saint. Um, so it gave me Yves Saint Laurent, which I don't think has anything to do with the Pope. Um, and then it gave me a football player, which is Alain Saint um, uh, Maximin, which not don't know. And then a person who's called Carl Pope, uh, who's the senior advisory of the UN convoy for cities and climate. So nothing to do, but this is what AI was 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 polling. Now, this is just funny, you know, and it's but we also have to really think about how these things are, are, are going to be going to uh, be, be impacted. The other thing that we need to think about here is data privacy. And this, I think, is something that anybody who's dealing with people data, we're seeing a ton of data being generated. And if we think about triangulation of that experience, think back to that example that I gave about you know, toilet paper. How comfortable am I that that company knows that information about me? Well, put it this way, I was very happy to get a coupon, but the cost of that coupon was my data. It's not just that they're giving me a coupon. They now know, am, did I use the coupon? And it gives them more information. When you use a loyalty card with a company, if you go to Starbucks or McDonald's or any of those, they get a lot of data from you. So when they say your 10th coffee is free, well, is it free, but it, you're also giving your data. That's the cost that they, that they get for it. Put that now into employees and how employees work. Do employees have to give all of that data to their employer? How much can they track? How much can they have access to? So I actually had one uh, company when I was working with them, consulting with them, they wanted to track the number of hours that people who had children, who were, who were parents, did versus those that did not. And that made me extremely uncomfortable because what are we going to do with that data? 
I mean, technically I could get it if we have it on the HR system, we have it in the learning system, but what are we doing? Are we going to say we're not going to hire parents? Are we going to pay parents less if they don't do as much learning? I didn't understand where that was going. Well, I knew where it was going and it was to me very unethical. And that's just one example. What are we trying to do with this? So if you think of LinkedIn owned by Microsoft and what data that's being generated as you use um, Microsoft 365 and you use LinkedIn, it can track you through that a whole entire experience. It can predict probably when you're looking for a job or when you might be thinking about resigning. It might it does all of those things, but how much of that is ethical and what autonomy do, do employees have? We do have something called GDPR which should apply to employees, but does it really? And this includes things like the right to be forgotten. Do we forget an employee? We sometimes legally have to keep that information, particularly if it's a highly regulated environment. So it gets to be really complex. And do employees necessarily know what information is being tracked about them? And for what reason? Um, companies, Some companies in geographies right now, some countries are being very proactive about being in Germany, for example, is very clear about, you know, what data can and cannot be collected. In fact, you, a lot of companies there cannot access the data generated by Microsoft 365 or Microsoft Teams. Um, even if it's at an anonymous level, it's hard to do. You really, you can get into some trouble. So these are going to be more and more questions that when we think about how we upskill employees and what it means for a skilled workforce, are we using data in the right way? So here's another example. And if an employee on their own laptop and their own Wi-Fi connection, so using their own data, and it's 9 p.m. after work, and they take a course, who owns that data? Does the employee, because they have accessed it on their own time with their own device, or does the employer own it because they purchased the course? These are ethical dilemmas that we need we need to think about. And um, so there's lots in there. I, I just wanted to touch on this because I think if you are concerned with people development and with all of these new systems that are coming in and what they're tracking, these are questions we'll all need to, to, to answer. Now I mentioned before, because I wanted to be you know, pretty, pretty practical. Um, if you some companies will decide to build their own framework, which I did not recommend, but if you decide that that's the direction you, you need to go in because you think your industry is unique, there are places where you can get some. I have, I've listed some here, uh, SFIA, OECD, IAEA. You can typically get that. If you're using Workday, for example, their learning management system, they will come with a framework or a taxonomy. But you need to make sure that if you are using one of these, these taxonomies that you are going to have the skills and resources to keep these up to date. That's the real thing because skills, you wanna make sure that you are to getting rid of skills that are outdated and you're also keeping on top of what are skills that are in demand that you want to be, uh, to be linked with. And it's not a once and done exercise. So you need to really be, be critically, uh, you know, I won't read all the points on the slide, but these are some things that you, you do want to consider if you are looking at your, your own framework. But again, not recommended, but I wanted to touch on it because I know some companies do want to build uh, their own. So these are some of the things that you want to be looked at. I also wanted to point out is there are some pitfalls. Nobody's got this right, okay? now. Companies like ING Bank might say they've, they've got this perfect, you know, it's going to be, you know, but there's case studies and then there's reality. So this is what I see when I go into companies and there, I'm sharing these with you because there's things for you to, to, to think about. So the main one that I mentioned before is that the data is in multiple locations and formats. There's not a standard way for these, these systems to speak to each other. So therefore the data is in multiple platforms and it can be a, a, a poor user experience and the data that's generated, you can't do anything really with it unless you have a data scientist and you invest in that time. And so it can be very frustrating. Also from an employee perspective, from a user experience, they have to enter their data on multiple platforms. It can be really quite, uh, you know, quite un uncomfortable and, and, and it's difficult. 
Um, often, too, the transition to a skills-based organization is just sitting at the L&D and HR level, and it really needs to be C-suite involvement, particularly if you're going to level three. And they usually will have decided that, but they need to endorse it. They can't just say, we want to go into a skills-based organization operating model. We have, to, we have to change that. The other thing, too, is that skills are constantly in flux, and you have to be adaptable to that, everyone involved in this. So if a skill, new skill comes in, you're going to have decision points. Do you, are you going to upskill people in that? What will that look like? How many people will be upskilled in that? Uh, the, you need to always be having that. Annual planning is not going to, to work for you. Um, it's simply not going to be uh, possible for you. You're going to have to work on, on a much faster level. And then finally, uh, data privacy, which I mentioned is, uh, we talked uh, a little bit about that before. So if you are planning to get started and, and, and embark on a skills-based uh, journey, you know, talk to, if you're not in these particular roles, talk to either HR talent and C-suite and ask them, what are their plans for this? What are they trying to do with, with this? And, and get, that, get that clarity. As I said, don't rush out and buy your own skills taxonomy or build your own. You know, be very, very mindful. Don't try and do every single skill. Start very, very small. You want to get ahead of new technologies that are coming out because there are a lot of them. This is a really good time to do your research and learn from other people's mistakes. So we're see, I mentioned talent marketplaces like Globe, Fuel 50, Eightfold. We're also seeing coaching platforms that do coaching at scale. Um, so this is like uh, Ezra Coaching is one example. Coach Hub is another. Um, so they become part of your, your learning experience and they're, they're all done digitally. Again, this is a good time for you to start start exploring what some of those are and where they'll fit in your organization. However, you also want to be really hyper aware that there's a lot of players. Do your research. Um, what can sound good on paper, I often see too when companies will tell me they're, they have AI, I look at it and say, well, that's an algorithm. That's not machine learning or, or artificial intelligence. It's a good algorithm, but that's all it is. So do, do your due diligence. I said before, start with one or two prototypes for upskilling. Start there. Can you do this? And what does it take? What does it cost? Those are the places to, to, uh, to really make sure you've got that part right. And get a commitment from stakeholders. Um, and by commitment, I mean money. <laughs> money and endorsement that they are going to actually absolutely uh, sponsor you. They are going to give you the funds to do this, the resources, if this is the direction that they want to go. Because the reality is, is right now, we, we are heading into an economic downturn, which is unfortunate. Um, I don't like to use the recession word, but we, we are seeing, we're seeing a very unusual economic climate. So we have to be very, very mindful. So some advice there, I've always said, stay in your own lane, <laughs> but now is not the time to be pedant. Um, right, I've actually sat in meetings with senior leadership where they're debating what is actually a skill. And I, get why that's important, but now is not the time to be that difficult. I, because a skill, as I found working with multiple co companies, yes, I can give you the definition of a skill, but what is a skill will matter, or what level a skill is, is going to matter to the company. And it's going to be specific to that business. And it's going to vary if you moved out of that business. So now is the, the, the time to, to, to think. Your job as, as a people a professional is probably gonna change your, yourself, um, you know, from task to skill. So now is a really good time too to think about what skills are needed in your profession and where you should be upskilling. See if you can get uh, ahead of that because it is, uh, it is quite uh, important. And this, this is gonna be something that becomes more and more uh, critical. These were some of the, um, some of the uh, resources I talked about, again, you will get these slides. So one is a Unilever case study that uses both Gloat and Degree. Degree is a learning platform, if you're not familiar with it, and Gloat is a talent marketplace. Um, but you'll see it, it again, it's where it has, it, there are some challenges because the data has to be entered on three, three different platforms, but it's still worth learning or reading. Deloitte white paper here is the skills-based organization, um, is very, very good if you just want something to, uh, it's very well written, um, very well researched, and it, it explains sort of this entire movement to a skills-based organization and where companies are right now. Um, so I, I would recommend having a look at that. 
An interesting uh, paper that came out as well uh, was the state of learning at Amazon. And what was really interesting in this, interesting in this one, is that they estimated a waste of 725 million uh, U.S. dollars. They weren't able to track any of their learning against goals, and their skilling plans were just just horrendous. But I don't want to point fingers because I can go into a number of different companies that are at that size and see very similar things. Um, so I, I, this happened to be just an excellent piece of research um, that, that I do recommend that uh, people you know, consider having, having a look at. Because I think it also too just, it, it's, it's a very transparent look at, uh, at what uh, is happening with, with skilling um, and one that can help you prevent a lot of mistakes. At the end of it all though, my thinking here is, so why even do this? I've said what's good for the company, right? And why companies, we started out with that, why companies want to start moving to, to skills and why they want to start measuring that. But I think what would be great if we do this right and if we do this ethically, I would love if people were able to get access to opportunities, not just because of who they know and not just because of how well they used keywords in, a, in their CV or their resume, but they actually we could see their demonstrated abilities. We were able to look at, at people and say, they've actually acquired the skill, they've practiced it, they've been in a talent marketplace, they've done projects in it, not just what they put on LinkedIn. And I mean, I use LinkedIn all the time, I have a course on there, but the reality is I could put that I'm an expert in JSON. I'm not, but I could put it there and I might still get an interview. Whereas somebody who has that experience and maybe didn't update that or, or keep it current, wouldn't it be great if they they were look, be able to, to get access to these opportunities? This is a utopian fairy tale. I know this, um, but when I think about skills and when we're tracking skills and what this actually means, this is the direction I would love to see us go in. Blockchain of skills, we even see. If you now go on places like GitHub, a lot of uh, in technical skills, IT, you know, people, the blockchain, everyone has to validate or agree that that, chain, that skill has been acquired. Uh, very, very fascinating. Um, and I think it's very interesting because it does break down a lot of those barriers. So people who maybe haven't had access to second uh, to college education, but they've been working on multiple projects and, and, and whatnot, they can demonstrate they have these skills and not a degree. And what does a degree even mean? Uh, maybe if they've come from um, different disadvantaged backgrounds, they've come where the places are war, their education was disrupted and they had to jump into the workforce in different ways. Those, this is where I see the possibilities. So maybe it's a fairy tale, but when I think about this whole transformation to skills and when I advise clients, this is where I'd really like to see us go. So with that, um, you know who I am. Um, I'm here to answer any questions for you. Um, I'd love to hear comments and, and suggestions or uh, criticisms, please. Um, this is where you can find me. I'm in Canada. Um, I'm typically on LinkedIn. I do travel a lot. Um, so if you follow me on LinkedIn, it'll say where, where in the world I will, I will be. And thank you very much for, for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lori, uh, for such an interesting information, uh, for sharing your knowledge, your experience. It's really, really very useful and important for everyone, for all the representatives of our EBA members. Uh, dear colleagues, this is the time for the questions. Please, uh, um, I don't think that there is, um, you, you have to write something down in the uh, chat box. You can just mm -hmm. switch on your mics and speak loudly. If you have any questions, comments, or whatever you would like to, to speak, to tell, to share, probably some of your knowledge, some of your experience. Thank you, Slava. I appreciate the, uh, the feedback. I'm glad it was a, a good use of your time. Okay, dear colleagues, if you do not have the questions right now, but probably you will have the questions after you uh, review the presentation, uh, watch the video recording of the of the presentation of the lecture, you can address all your questions to Lori via LinkedIn, she's in LinkedIn, or to us, and then we forward the questions to Lori, and in such individual way, we will answer them. Thank you, thank you very much. It is very valuable and interesting. I see the comments and the feedback. Uh, in the chat box. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, have a nice evening and see you next time at our other events. Thank you, Laurie, for being with Thanks. us.
so early in the morning in Canada, I know. <laughs> no problem at all. Thank you also to, to you and to EBA and uh, for everybody for, for, for joining. Um, I appreciate the, the comments. I hope they're not are generated by uh, chat GPT. <laughs> they're legitimate comments, um, but I hope that that was helpful. And do please connect on, on LinkedIn um, or you know feel free to email me or contact me with any questions you might have generated by humans. Thank you, Olga. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Have Thank a great you, day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.